Well, good evening, everyone. My name is David Rubinger. I'm the market president and publisher of the Atlanta Business Chronicle. And I want to thank the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Atlanta and the CDC Foundation for giving me the honor of uh, serving as your moderator tonight for, uh, for this set. And we're going to be talking about how digital technology helped Taiwan combat COVID-19. And what lessons can the United States learn from Taiwan and what we can all learn from the power of digital technology going forward. We're going to be here for one hour. Um, and in the last 10 minutes, there will be a time for questions and answers. So please make sure you have your chat box open on the right hand side so you can uh, put your questions in box as they're fresh in your mind. And we'll try to get to some of the questions uh, during the Q&A at the end. But uh, but again, it's it's my honor to be with you. Um, and all the I know there are many. If if we were meeting in person, I would introduce all the elected officials who are going to are in the room. Obviously, I can't do that tonight. So for all the elected officials who are on the line, both from the state of Georgia, the state of Tennessee, from Taiwan, uh, and anybody else, uh, my apologies for not giving you a personal introduction. Uh, but uh, thank you for for being with us on this important topic that. Uh, is so critical to our public health in both of our countries. So again, thank you for this opportunity. Before uh, we get onto the program, uh, we have the evening, we're gonna have opening remarks from uh, Elliot Wang, uh, the Director General, uh, and from Kathleen Toomey, who's the Commissioner of Public uh, Health for the state of Georgia. We'll then have a brief uh, pause for a group photo of the panelists. And then we're gonna hear from um, uh, Digital Minister Audrey Tang, uh, who's going to give us uh, a, a full overview of what's going on in Taiwan right now, followed by our panel discussion that will include uh, Minister Tang and uh, Dr. Carlos Del Rio from the Emory School of Medicine, Dr. Daniel Dernigan from the CDC, and Dr. Judy Monroe from the CDC Foundation. So I'm looking forward to this program. I think it's going to be fascinating. And I can't wait to hear what everyone has to say. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Elliot Wang, the Director General of Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Atlanta, for opening remarks. Elliot? Elliot? Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you uh, so much for uh, taking time uh, out of your family time, dinner times, uh, for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, I think uh, the purpose of uh, tonight's panel is to uh, uncover the methods that uh, Taiwan used to um, manage the pandemic and what the others can uh, uh, learn from uh, its experiences. I would say that uh, we couldn't uh, have this uh, highlighted webinar without the heavyweight guests with us today. So I want to thank our co-host, uh, the CTC Foundation, and our speaker today, the three panelists, and uh, of course, uh, the moderators. Uh, who are all the leading uh, figures in their professions and the business. So we are so honored to have them all today. I still recall that uh, before I arrived in Atlanta last July, I was able to see uh, Taiwan's use of uh, big data and uh, technology with my own eyes. One of the most impressive uh, initiatives I witnessed was the life map of a local supplies of a uh, fast uh, masks, which was uh, accessible through uh, the eMap app. This innovation was created uh, by today's uh, speaker, Minister Tang, who was a key leader in managing uh, mask supply by responding to real-time occurrences. All the efforts the Taiwanese uh, government and the people demonstrated uh, during the pandemic, I would uh, call it the uh, 3T. First, trust over fear. By sharing information and uh, transparency, people can uh, engage with governments to address issues uh, without uh, succumbing to fear. Secondly, teamwork in action. Our citizens uh, place their communities over their individual interests, thereby empowering one another to fight COVID-19. So by combining technological prowess with uh, collective uh, action, then it comes to the third T, which is uh, Taiwan can help. 
other countries achieve the same goals. As everybody knows that virus knows no borders. That is why my office is hosting this event in efforts to share the lessons Taiwan has learned from COVID-19 to the world. To accomplish this, the message, let Taiwan help, is a call for international organizations, particularly the WHO, to include Taiwan in global efforts to end the COVID-19 pandemic. This evening, our guests will share thoughts on how Taiwan has succeeded in protecting its people from the pandemic and how it can help other countries achieve the same. So I really look forward to today's uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Director Thank General. You, Director General. And now we have some uh, pre-recorded remarks from Kathleen Toomey, the Commissioner, Department of Public Health of the State of Georgia. Coming in one second. We might be having technical difficulties with Commissioner Toomey's remarks. If, if, oh, here we go. I cannot hear. Thank you. Wait. Wait for day. Our apologies. We had, didn't have this problem last night, so I, I'm not quite sure what's happening. Thank you. Stop it. Stop. So you, you didn't see that video? He did not. Unfortunately, there was no sound. There was no sound. Oh, OK. Oh, OK. Oh, guys, I'll move. So, so can we do it again right now? If it, if you, if it doesn't work again, then maybe we can move on to Mr. Uh, Tang's remarks. Sure, sure. We will play the video again. OK. okay. Good evening. I want to thank all of you for participating in this important oh, I, have for you. I expect you want to recognize Minister Tang for sharing Taiwan's very successful work in combating COVID-19. And to convey thanks on behalf of the Department of Public Health and the state of Georgia for the medical supplies that were sent to us from Taiwan at a highly critical point in our pandemic response. This unprecedented global emergency has highlighted the need for collaboration with our borders and the importance of building partnerships in our response to share best practices and lessons learned to stop the spread of COVID-19 and to save lives around the world. 
everyone on this panel has contributed significantly to enhancing Georgia's response to COVID-19. And I particularly want to thank Dr. Judy Monroe and the CDC Foundation for their support for some of the most creative and impactful work in Georgia. Although I am not able to participate due to a previously scheduled work commitment, I look forward to hearing about what I believe will be a robust and thoughtful discussion tonight. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Commissioner Toomey. Um, and now, as was instructed to me, there's now going to be, this is something I've never done before, a group photo on a Zoom call. So I assume there's going to be a group photo of the, uh, to be taken. So um, Elliot, you just let me know when the group photo has been taken, and then we'll be able to move on for the program at that point. At that point. Okay, one, two, three. One more, you want one more? Yeah. Okay, let's do it one more one more time. One, two, three. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. I, I feel like I'm at a, a family reunion where we all have to, you know, take our photos. That's perfect. Well, it is my honor and my privilege to introduce uh, the digital minister of Taiwan, Audrey Tang, her official title is Minister Without Portfolio Executive Yuan, but I thought Digital Minister would fit better for the conversation for this evening. Um, Minister, the, the floor is yours. Uh, I look forward to your remarks. And then when uh, when she's done with the remarks, we will then go into our discussion. So thank you again, and I look forward to your, your conversation. Thank you. Um, so is the sound getting through? I hope so. Okay, excellent. Uh, and I'll uh, share the video. Uh, well, uh, the presentation, let's not do <laughs> more video sharing at, at this moment. Um, so if you can see some cute uh, dogs, uh, that means that uh, sharing is working. Does it work? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, really happy to be here. Uh, good luck time, everyone. I'm here to share some thoughts around how we successfully so far um, fought the pandemic with no lockdown and with fingers crossed that we will not enter one uh, like within this week. Uh, but so far, we've uh, managed to fight COVID with no lockdown and also the related infodemic, that's to say conspiracy theories, anxieties um, on social media and so on uh, with no takedown uh, because we, uh, like the U.S., uh, value the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly and so on. So we need to innovate with the people, with the civil society, not just for the people. And that's the core message today. Um, and um, in the very beginning uh, of the pandemic, Taiwan responded um, in 2019, actually. Um, and this is what we call the fast, fair, fun pillars uh, in digital social innovation, which means everyone's business with everybody's help. In 2019, December 31st, on PTT, it's a uh, public digital infrastructure that's subsidized in Taiwan by the state through the National Taiwan University. Um, it's run by a bunch of uh, civic technologists for the past 25 years. Uh, no advertisement, no shareholders, really. It's uh, like just part of the civic infrastructure. So uh, because it has no advertisers, shareholders, it means that when Dr. Li Wenliang's message got reposted there at the uh, last day of 2019, it gets upvoted very quickly and people contribute to their expertise to triage this message and this uh, and I quote seven new SARS cases in the Huanan seafood market end of quote while it did not reach all people in Wuhan at a time for obvious reasons it did um, reach everyone in Taiwan so on the very next day on the 1st of January we began health inspection for flight passengers coming in from Wuhan and this says to me two things First, that the government trusts the citizens enough, right, to talk about SARS epidemic, to triage this um, issue on the public forum. And according to a Civicus Monitor, we're the only place in Asia that has the complete freedom of speech to do so. And the citizens trusted government to act quickly whenever something uh, emerging is discovered by the collective intelligence. 
Now, um, you're looking at uh, the daily press conference uh, and the commander Chen Shizhong is at the middle and they're wearing pink mask. And this is because uh, on last April uh, in the 1922, a toll free number where everybody can call uh, to respond uh, with any new piece of information. We have a country with 24 ish million people. Uh, and last year, there's more than 2 million calls to that toll free number. So last April, there was a young boy that called saying, Hey, you're rationing out mask. Uh, all I have is pink mask, but I don't want to wear pink to school as I'm a boy. And all the boys in my class have navy blue uh, medical grade mask. Uh, so um, do something about it. And then the very next day, all the medical officers, as you see here in the press conference at 2 p.m., where the journalists asked them all questions, uh, well, they, they all wear pink. And Minister Chen even said that Pink Panther was his childhood hero. And suddenly, the, the young boy became the most hit boy in the class, where only he has the color that the heroes wear and the hero's hero wear. So this is, I think, uh, the digital communication with a aim to do not just gender mainstreaming, but also put uh, calm and collectedness instead of kind of fighting against one another uh, into the conversation during the pandemic. Now, the fair part, I alluded to the mask rationing, and this is uh, also in January. On January 31st, um, the public epidemiologists, public health experts, um, Chen Yixuan and Fang Qitai, uh, gave a presentation in the cabinet office. According to their numeric model, if we can get 75% of people in all districts um, wearing masks and washing their hands, then even if there's some small community transmission, it will not spread. It will uh, get flattened immediately because the R value will be below one. Um, and so uh, how to get 75% coverage uh, become the most important issue. And uh, we, at the time, made sure that everyone gets the equal access because we have universal broadband and universal healthcare. And so based on these two, again, digital infrastructure, uh, we made the system where everyone can go to the pharmacy and uh, get the mask ration with the pharmacists, um, as pictured here, uh, the person in the middle is our president, not a pharmacist, but everybody else is a pharmacist. Uh, they can uh, hand out those rationed masks uh, to immigrant workers, really to everyone with a national health card. You don't have to be a citizen. And this uh, number of available stockpiles uh, in each pharmacy is updated in real time as open data every 30 seconds. So we have more than 100 tools within just three days of development that can show the real time availability as you're queuing so that people queuing um, after you can see exactly how many masks did you just purchase. Uh, and then if it's uh, running low, then you can get a navigation tip to a nearby pharmacy so people do not have to queue in vain. Um, and so it includes maps, apps, chatbots, and voice assistance because open API is an open standard everybody can create a tool that fits their needs. Moreover, it also uh, made possible for the individuals in the civil society data scientists to analyze this data and point out the data bias. In the beginning, we look at this and see the population center and the pharmacy distribution align almost perfectly. So we think we have a fair distribution. But a MP, uh, member of parliament, Gao Hong An, uh, she was VP of data analytics at Foxconn. So she knows something about data before uh, getting into the parliament. Work with the open street map community to point out the data bias because um, not everybody own a helicopter. So the distance on the map doesn't translate to the hours spent to actually go to the nearby pharmacies. So in the rural places where people have to take a bus and so on to get to the nearby pharmacy, actually it's not fair to them. And so because of that, we changed uh, the distribution mechanism and introduced pre-ordering 24 hours after she pointed this out. Minister Chen Shizong just said, legislator, teach us. So again, um, it doesn't matter that they belong to different political parties. Based on evidence and based on data, it, it, this enables science-based uh, co-creation. So that's the fair part. And finally, the, the fun part. So uh, when we work, for example, with convenience store um, to roll out mask pre-ordering, uh, you see a lot of uh, coupons, a lot of ways that people kind of celebrate uh, this as a way to easily get the mask. And this is not uh, a one-shot thing. Actually, all the different communication material uh, came with a deliberate design that put what we call humor over rumor. 
whenever there is a rumor, for example, about mask uh, efficacy, uh, then the very cute spokesdoc from the CECC uh, says something uh, like, uh, it's hard to translate, but uh, I'll try. Uh, this is basically saying, uh, the mask protect your own mouth against your own unwashed hands. And so this appeals to uh, rational self-interest. It's fun. Uh, just like this one about physical distancing. When you're indoor, keep three Shiba Inu you know, wear, wear a mask. When you're outdoor, keep two Shiba Inu you know, wear, or wear a mask. Uh, people can't really unsee it, right? It's it's quite mimetic. Uh, and then it also enabled easy remixing and sharing of this information. So we've collected all these measures into Taiwan can help that us, and you can check out Taiwan can help that us uh, for the measures that we're taking. Uh, and the 1922 and the mask rationing are just two of the many digital infrastructure that we put to use to reduce the R value to be under one. Um, so with, um, I think, 200 something uh, confirmed cases yesterday, um, 300 something the day before, uh, we're looking at a somewhat flattened curve, uh, putting us in a ballpark with Georgia, I think. Uh, and so um, I think uh, I look forward to the discussion and really Taiwan can help um, that us. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up, I've been reading the news about what's been going on uh, in Taiwan over the last week. And uh, it, it seems like at least having the, div the digital infrastructure that you have in place right now is still help, is still a, a great help that allows you to combat these cases that have surfaced. It, it, ha has there been any learning that you've experienced in the past week that, that you think is, is going to help Taiwan get through this uh, this little surge you're having right now? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and then I'm going to share with you the press conference at the cabinet office uh, roughly three hours from now, and you're the first people in the world to see this, <laughs> right? Uh, we, we just extended 1922's um, capabilities. Uh, and this is important to work with contact tracers now that we enter the community spread stage uh, to very quickly identify the persons uh, who have been uh, checking in the same uh, venue or the same space or even the same uh, moving like a train or something like that. And so uh, in around the world, the most difficult part is how to simplify this procedure so that people would actually want to do that, right? Uh, and so the uh, system that we co-invented uh, with the GovZero community, uh, the original folks that did the uh, mask rationing and so on, uh, is this what we call the SMA-based uh, check-in system. And this system, I hope you can see this. It has a CDC logo too, but it's it's our CDC. Anyway, so um, if you actually, actually, this is scannable. If you scan this QR code, uh, you will see that it triggers not a browser, it triggers the automated SMS that already have filled in, pre-fill in the place code so that when you hit send, it just take um, five seconds. Everybody can do so. Um, if you are a elderly person, if your phone doesn't have a camera, uh, all of this still works. And once you check it in, then um, the system, the 1922 system, automatically knows your phone number and the place you're in. And this is integrated into our contact tracing system immediately so that um, exposure notification can work without any manual collection uh, with pen and paper or third party apps or data storage in the cl public cloud or things like that is squarely in the five telecoms system. And so um, this, I think, um, puts really a lot of uh, perspective into the kind of infrastructure we already had so that we were able to develop this system within literally 24 hours uh, and test it in 24 hours and now uh, rolling it out. So this is a, a kind of fresh update. Great. Dr. Jernigan, I'd like to bring you in on this. Uh, you're probably watching this with a certain degree of fascination from your perspective. For those of you who don't know who are on the call, Daniel Jernigan is the Acting Deputy Director for Public health science and surveillance at the CDC. In his position, he's responsible for strengthening the CDC's scientific foundation by working across the Office of Science, the Office of Laboratory Science and Safety, the Center for Surveillance, Epi Epidemiology. In easy words, he's the man who basically is in charge of all the data collection type of things. What, tell me, what, when you look at a, a country like Taiwan, Dr. Jernigan, what do you think about what we try to do in the United States towards, um, uh, towards gathering data and trying to fight off pandemic disease.
Dr. Jernigan, you're muted, I believe. Yeah, can you yeah, there can we you go. Now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, great. Yeah, so uh, I actually uh, have a little experience. Uh, back in 2003, uh, with, with the team to Taipei uh, for SARS. And at that time, it was an incredible time. But what was most amazing was the use of technology. At that time, it was webcams that were put into people's homes so that they could monitor them for quarantine, et cetera. And so the, 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 the approach to using technology to solve problems quickly, I think, is something that we have seen over and over in Taiwan. And so this to me, it's just a, another example, but a really exciting example of how that technology can be in order to improve contact tracing, identification masks, all of those things. Uh, there are so many more technological capabilities that we have now, uh, but the problem is we don't have enough people that understand public health, understand uh, digital science. They don't understand how to put all those things together. And so I think what we see here is this capability to bring that all together with the public health mission and end in mind, and then applying those things to uh, to really make a change in how people are behaving, uh, but also in their access to, uh, to, uh, to PPE and other re uh, resources. Dr. Del Rio, from your perspective um, as, as a clinician, uh, and again, for people who don't know who Dr. Del Rio is, he's a professor of medicine, uh, in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Emory University School of Medicine, uh, and the Executive Associate Dean for Emory at Grady. Um, I mean, you've been you've been on the front lines of of, of COVID nineteen as well as other uh, issues like this. You look at what a Taiwan does. What do you wish we had in the United States that we could adopt from what they're doing realistically within a, within the framework of our society that could maybe that we could tackle at some point. Well, as Dr. Jer as Dr. Jernigan has said, uh, the the use of digital information and of, of big data uh, has actually been used much more effectively by business than by healthcare or by public health. I think about there was this very astonishing story about a, a, a father receiving a note at his at his house to his daughter saying that she may be interested in buying diapers and bottles. And she, he said, what's going on? Well, it turns out his daughter was pregnant and he didn't know, and that's how she found out she was pregnant. And he found out because Walmart had used, or Target had used all this information about what she was looking at, et cetera. And they had integrated the data and had assured, had com were convinced now that she was pregnant and therefore started marketing stuff to pregnant women. And I think this is how business, business is very good at using digital information to do the kinds of things they need to do. So when I think about you and you know the Atlanta Business Chronicle, I really think about how business has learned how to use digital data in order to target advertising. I mean, I look something up in the web and within seconds, I'm getting all sorts of ads in my phone looking at information, yet in public health, I mean, if I'm looking for COVID information and COVID testing, I should be immediately getting an SMS of where can I get a vaccine? Where can I get a test? What's going on? And you know, rapidly integrate this. So I think using digital information, all that great data out there, to better facilitate healthcare and access to public health and public health interventions is something that we really need to be doing. And you know, I know there's a lot of impediments like HIPAA and other things, but honestly, I don't think HIPAA applies that here. I think we just need to move in this direction because the power of digital technology is something that we have not explored the way we should in public health. Dr. Monroe, from the CDC Foundation's perspective as the bridge between uh, the private sector, if you will, and the work of the CDC, what are the types of things your organization is doing to help bring these things about? I, I know your relationship with, with Taiwan is very close and you've, you've worked with the minister and others there. What, what do you see are the opportunities there the CDC Foundation could, uh, could exploit to help uh, American healthcare system? Yeah, thanks for the question. So, uh, first of all, I, I thank you, Minister Tang, and uh, wonderful presentation and, and terrific work. And I want to echo uh, my experience in visiting Taiwan and working uh, with uh, Taiwan CDC and public health officials. Uh, they they really have leaned into using technology uh, in very powerful ways. Um, and I want to highlight, I think here in the United States, I, I want to put a punctuation mark uh, around the, the fun portion, uh, the humor, I, I think that is so fantastic uh, for social cohesion 
I think that's something that here in the United States we could, could use more of uh, because we do uh, need to um, move toward using today's technology. At, at the foundation uh, throughout COVID, I've had the opportunity to work with a, a number of businesses and there certainly are a number of either startup or more mature uh, uh, businesses that are using open uh, public information, uh, gathering that and then applying artificial intelligence to gather uh, and, and have intelligence uh, that, that can be targeted for, for various things. Um, it, it has, of course, it's more challenging here in the United States uh, with the, uh, some of the systems that we have to go through. But I think at the foundation, we, um, we, we are working with CDC and working with our partners to help bridge M much that we can learn from Taiwan. I, I thought the remarks, uh, Minister Tang, when you brought up um, uh, brought up reaching people in the in the in the outer lying areas that don't have access to a helicopter, the first thing I thought of here in Georgia is the biggest crisis we have locally is is around rural health and being able to reach uh, certain parts of our population because they're in remote places where they don't have proper health care that the hospitals are are, are going away. To me, that was a very powerful message about the, the fact that Taiwan's trying to figure out a way to make sure there's a certain degree of equity. Now, of course, you have socialized medicine in Taiwan. We don't have that in the United States. What lessons could we learn here towards uh, towards ma maybe making certain improvements while still maintaining our privatized system? Or do you think we just have to go to socialized medicine in order for this to work? Well, I am biased because socialized medicine is in our constitutional amendment. Right. So <laughs> it's a constitutional duty for the state to provide learning, uh, health, uh, and communication. These are the three social rights. So uh, of course, I'm going to, as a Taiwanese, say these are good things. Um, however, uh, in, in our um, experience, the socialized healthcare system, the clinics, the pharmacies, and so on, does have its limit uh, to serve the most rural places or remote islands, uh, and so on, uh, for obvious reasons. And that is why we worked with the convenience convenience stores uh, in Taiwan. Uh, what, what you're looking at uh, here uh, is a, a family mart, uh, one of the leading convenience store chains. Uh, and this uh, elderly person uh, is a friend of my own grandmother. I, I uh, design all these digital systems and I focus group test it with my grandma, uh, who is um, 88 years old and live in a rather more remote place uh, than the type of city that I am now. I visit her every couple of weeks, uh, every other week. Um, and so I, I check this, uh, um, idea of using um, at the time we were designing uh, because all the convenience stores in the rural places have an automated teller machine uh, and so we're testing this idea that they can take their bank card there uh, and wire a very small amount of money um, about two US dollars uh, to our CDC uh, and get a receipt and use that in the convenience store to pick up the medical grade mask uh, and so this used none of the pharmacy clinic infrastructure this used the existing infrastructure in the remote places of convenience store logistics. Um, but uh, she said, well, um, of course, she is 88. She doesn't personally go to pharmacy anymore, so she can't quite test. So she recommends her younger friends to work with me. And this Grandma Young is her young friend, uh, 77 years old. Uh, and wh while we're um, doing the focus group test, uh, Grandma Young said she would rather take hours and queue in line to go to the pharmacy uh, in the nearby town instead of going to a convenience store, which is literally like a uh, five minutes walk um, away, uh, if we ask her to use the debit card because she was very afraid that if she entered her password wrong, she will wire not two US dollars, but 2000 US dollars <laughs> to the CDC account. There's this kind of innate uh, fear of the, her debit cards, not uh, password being gleaned by the person queuing after her or whatever. Uh, so she said, you just have to use the health card uh, because our health card is special. The IC based health card introduced right after SARS in 2003, uh, made sure that this can only be read for medical or public services its purposes and must never be used uh, for commercial or other purposes. And so there's an innate trust in that card instead of her bank card. So we repurposed the uh, convenience store system again in just 24 hours so that she can use the medical card and then get the same receipt and then pay in coins uh, to that counter uh, to US dollars to get a mask. Uh, and then she's very happy about it. And she told her younger friend, like 66 years old uh, and so on. And so that's just one of the stories for inclusion. 
I love that story. It's uh, it's like my own mother. She's saying, who's 86, she's always saying, I'm always looking for people uh, younger than me to hang out with, you know, like people in their 70s. That's awesome. That's great. So so back to um, to Dr. Jernigan, Dr. Del Rio. It sounds like this conversation is as much about policy as it is about practice. In easier words, in other words, as long as we have certain policies in place in in American healthcare society, we we have to find a way to uh, to use digital technology while maintaining the privacy rights that exist within within what we have going on. So, does it mean we're going to have to eventually change policy in order to be able to adopt these things that have been so effective in in a civil society like Taiwan? And it, or is that just not realistic? Dr. Jernigan, you want to give that a shot? I mean, I'm sure this is what you guys talk about all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, uh, for instance, there are some uh, contact tracing apps that you can uh, opt in on your phone that Google and Apple have put together. And so th those are ways that you can, without identifying yourself, you know, if you say that I turned positive, people that have come near you are able to, to know about that and you can actually, uh, they can be treated as contacts, they can be told hey, you know, somebody that you are near is positive, you should go and get a test. So we have been able to, to get that implemented in the United States. It's taken a while, and just to your point about uh, policies, right now we have the app uh, about more than 50% of the adult smartphone using U.S. population in 24 states. Uh, but there are a lot of states that we don't have any because the policies vary from state to state. And so in order for us to have wide application of available technology, we do have to go through these steps that are important. That's why we have different states, different rules. <laughs> We're, uh, public health is a state-based kind of activity in the United States. And so, uh, but we, we, I, we see that if people can see how a technology is used, they can see that example, it's a whole lot easier for them to then adopt those kinds of technologies. So the more we can get these technologies out there, people can see their benefits, it makes it a whole lot easier for them to get accepted. And, and have you seen that applied even more widely in the in the issue of rural healthcare, where technology and telemedicine have, have maybe had a little bit more of a jump start to help you in some of these cases? Yeah, I mean, uh, th there are still places within the United States, of course, that have difficulty with getting connectivity, uh, which makes it difficult for some of the new technologies to be as widely uh, available as possible. What we do see, though, you could call it a technical, technological uh, advance, but is the use of big box retail pharmacies like CVS, Walgreens, and things like that. Those are within, you know, five miles of most people in the United States right now. And so we can get telemedicine in those places. We can get um, the access to different uh, therapies, et cetera, vaccines available at those sites. So utilizing those non-traditional sites and using technology to support that can really be a very good thing for getting uh, rural health care to get improved. Fair enough. Dr. Daria, if there was one thing that Taiwan was doing that you could bring, if you could wave a magic wand and you could have it be applied to the, the U.S. healthcare system to help you accomplish your goals as a doctor, what would it be? What would you like to see happen? What do you think would make your life a lot easier? Well, you know, it's it's a it's a, a an easy and a difficult question. I think the the easy answer is having a nationalized a national healthcare system, right? The fact that we don't have a healthcare system in this country is is probably one of the biggest burdens we have because we have this 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 just broken up system in which you know there's no communication. If a patient shows up in this ER and then the next day shows up in another ER, there's no communication. There's no way of knowing what's going on. And we waste a lot of resources as a result of that. And our healthcare system is one of the most expensive, the most expensive in the world without necessarily getting the best resources because we have a lot of waste in the system. So if I was going to adapt one thing, it's a nationalized healthcare system. But I want to comment on a few things that Dr. Jernigan said. I think what this pandemic has shown us is, is the, 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 the great limitations of having a, a public health system that is run at the state level. I think CDC has been unable to do the kind of stuff you need to do during a pandemic. Think about think about fighting a war state by state. Think about World War II. If the president had said, "Well, each state is going to have its own army, send people to Europe, 
and to the Pacific and figure out how to fight this war. They have to buy their own rifles. They have to figure out how to get there. We would have lost the war. And that's what happened with COVID. We lost the war because we did not have a national strategy. So I think we really need to think as a country how during a pandemic we should over supersede national state rules and have a national strategy that takes over in a response to a pandemic. We cannot have another pandemic under, under straight state regulations. And I think that's a really important strategy. The last thing I would say is that I think what this pandemic has shown us is the critical issue of the digital divide. There's many Americans still that do not have access to the internet in this 21st century. And I think one big problem that I see in our country compared to other places, I mean, I would say Kenya, where I work a lot, has better internet access and better internet capabilities that we have in America. And the reality is that in America, having using data is expensive. Everybody has to pay for it. And you know, in most countries, if you get a text message, you don't pay for it. It's free to you. The person that sends the message pays for it, but not the person that receives the message. In this country, I take care of a lot of, of poor and marginalized populations, which simply do not have access to data, do not have access to, to information, have very simple smartphones, you know, those, I mean, don't have smartphones, have very simple, you know, cell phones that do not have access to data. And therefore, you know, this whole access to telemedicine and digital device is clearly an issue for them. And I think we need to think about a way to give access to internet and, 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 and telemedicine capabilities to all the population, not just to the, to the ones that actually can actually afford it. You know, internet in this country is expensive and we need to be very clear about that. Dr. Monroe, uh, again, as the person who has conversations with the private sector on a regular basis with the foundation where you go out and seek grant money for various things, does the this infrastructure piece come up in, in your conversations with, with companies when in talking about helping to fund bridging these technological divides? Or do you typically stay on more of the clinical side of things? How do the conversations enter into the foundation? No, the, the, you know, thanks for the question. Our, the conversations are quite broad, and I think private sector certainly recognizes the need for improved infrastructure across this country. I mean, I couldn't uh, uh, agree more that, um, you know, especially during a pandemic or a public health emergency, you really need a national plan, and that needs to be executed uh, across the country. I mean, we've got, it's not just 50 states, but it's over 3,000 local health departments. I was the health officer in Indiana, and each, each county was independent, right? And there were many states. So you, you end up with uh, so much divide. Um, so no, I think the private sector uh, clearly sees that. And the private sector, of course, would like to see um, public health in, in the US be able to adopt new technologies faster. Uh, that, that's what I hear uh, quite often is they'd like to see, see that expedited. Um, and, and then the other thing I just, I, I want to just, again, highlight, I think that we can learn from Taiwan is the, um, this crowdsourced, I mean, having the, the public engaged in giving the, the information is just remarkable. Uh, to me. Um, we, it, we, we don't do that at scale, certainly in the United States. Yeah, I, I would say, uh, I love the way, again, we talked about the, what Minister Tang said about humor and about being able to reach, uh, almost th that you're creating a conversation that that everyone young old wants to participate in that it, it seems like it's part of your culture that people are, are are engaged and you also used a term that i have not heard very often and that's the infodemic term um minister tang talk to the concept of the infodemic is it something that perpetuates taiwanese society still to this day or have you been able to defeat that pretty much to where the, the people who are in the, the naysayers have now moved off to the side and are, are marginalized in, in conversations in society. Certainly. According to the World Health Organization, and I quote, an infodemic is too much information, including false or misleading information in digital or physical environments during the disease. Um, and so meaning that there's a overloading of information, some false, some true, some partial. Uh, and the issue here is how to make sure that people can access a contextualizing service reliably. 
That is to say, for each piece of information, which may be true or not, it's very easy to access the full context within which that this um, appears. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, for the infodemic, uh, we have quite a few designs that prove to be extremely popular. Um, for example, I was sharing the QR code scanner, right? The QR code scanner for our just introduced 1922 check-in code. But that QR code scanner itself is a very popular app, I think, by a majority used by a majority of our population um, that provides, if I zoom in a little bit, then you'll see it's not just a QR code scanner. It's also a way to track your uh, um, response after getting the vaccination. Uh, it's also a way to understand the worldwide context uh, of the pandemic. It's also a way to uh, ask pretty much any question via phone or SMS about a frequently asked questions, ask, ask a scientist, right, as a service and so on. So it's an integrated uh, portal uh, within one's pocket that whenever people uh, receive a piece of information, they can immediately forward it to this kind of chatbot or some other chatbot. There's also a very popular one developed by our leading antivirus company, the Trend Micro, and it would just fact check it and provide a contextualizing service automatically. And, and so that um, and people receive something about, I don't know, 5G uh, wires in the mosques. Well, we don't have that here actually, but, but say if they have, uh, then it would just provide this entire full context of when did this uh, piece of disinformation happen? When, where's the origin, how it mutates, uh, whether it has gone through recombination <laughs> and things like that. Uh, and, and then uh, people understand the whole thing without taking anything down. So it's a notice and public notice. And this relies of course on broadband access, because if you don't, you can't fact check a video. It's just not possible, right? Uh, and in Taiwan, uh, anywhere in Taiwan, even on the top of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters high, the Jade Mountain, you still have 10 megabits per second broadband. It's a guarantee. It's called broadband as a human right uh, for about 16 US dollars a month, unlimited data, meaning no marginal cost. Uh, and so, uh, and if you don't, it's my fault. And, and so I, I get these emails. Uh, there was an email a couple of months ago from somebody in a uh, quarantine place saying, you promised Robin as a human right, but it took me half a day to send this email. Uh, it turns out that in that one corner near the Yangming Mountains, uh, he can't receive a signal. Um, and so um, I, I'm like, of course, it's my fault. Uh, and so within a couple of weeks, we work with the telecom, we work with our NCC, uh, the National Communication Commission, and the, the, the new tower is there. Of course, by that time, he's out of quarantine. Uh, but he made a point of actually driving back, measuring the speed test, sharing on social media to hold me to account. So that's kind of our commitment to broadband. That's great. I mean, again, these are the types of things, the, the complexity of the United States, both political and healthcare system, of course, limits us from doing a lot of these things. But what you have going on there is such a great laboratory for things that we could maybe try to achieve over time. Uh, I want to ask the audience if you have any questions uh, pertaining to our discussion, please uh, put them into the chat box and we, we can we can talk about the these items more. The, the, I did get one question from someone says, and I don't miss or this is a question for you. Do you, is, is it common? Do you, do you have American citizens coming to Taiwan to go to medical school? Is it is there a um, is is there a is that a popular move? Because it would be an interesting place for an American medical student to study medicine and and your approach to civil society approach to healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know much about medical school, uh, but I know that many, including medical practitioners, but people working in science and technology, thousands and thousands of them are getting the Taiwan Gold Card, which is the kind of work open work visa that you don't have to work for any particular company. You can still right. telework with uh, someone uh, in the US and you can stay for around three years, enjoying our healthcare, bring your family, even during the pandemic. So th this program is quite popular and we do have people sharing their telemedicine um, expertise, working on telemedicine startups, telehealth startups, and so on, uh, using this gold card. So, so that I know. I don't know about pursuing medical school on the undergrad level. Yeah. Uh, and um, we, of course, the teaching in all schools in Taiwan, from the basic education onward, uh, we have English not as a foreign, but as a second language, meaning that people learn um, the, the arts uh, and I know, music, uh, creative endeavors, and so on, some uh, classes in English and other classes in mentoring. So it, it sounds like, Mr. Tang, that you, you've, you've developed a platform, if you will, that 
no matter what happens, if there's another outbreak of any type of disease pandemic, uh, that you 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 have the infrastructure in place to address these things through the civil society that that Taiwan's created. Um, what are you working on? What's in your laboratory now that you'd like that's going to be down the road that's going to make things even more effective for you? Obviously, you're learning from the last couple of weeks of what's going on. What what do you hope to see change? Do you want to see get even better for your for your country and for the work you're doing? Yeah, the the contact tracers and uh, we believe in agile development and on-site customer. So right within my office, like uh, literally. Uh, the closest seat to my office is now a professional contact tracer who have contact traced in SARS in 2003. So, so I work with her like literally every day. <laughs> and so uh, I think developing tools that make contact tracing easier uh, is, is really an art uh, because what, what we're looking at is that unless people understand they can feel safe, they can trust the contact tracer, you, you don't actually get any reliable data whatsoever. And this is not something you can solve with digital technology alone. It has to be digital social technology, <laughs> things that people will embrace um, voluntarily because they understand it's clearly informed that data is only kept for uh, two uh, spread cycles, incubation cycles, it's, right. uh, for specific and never for commercial purpose. So you'll never get an advertisement, uh, right? Uh, and it's uh, separate security also very important. And so we're learning on that, but uh, based on the past three days, uh, of record in the past three days, uh, I think more than one quarter of our population have already uh, installed the newly rolled out uh, exposure notification system uh, with um, Apple and Google. Um, and so that's a very high adoption rate uh, in just three days. Uh, and so people generally understood the technology underneath the contact tracer uh, is now learning how to work with the ENS uh, and the SMS based basing check-in system, basically take extra chore away from context tracer so they can focus on the people to people relationship but it's not about uh, replacing contact tracers it's not about a substitute for people to people relationship that's what we're learning in the past couple of days so dr turnigan um baby steps let's take baby steps what are the types of things with without giving up our privacy model that exists here what, what are the baby steps that we can do that we as American citizens can do to maybe help bring some about some small additional changes in the future as as we as we uh, try to collect more data, do better contact tracing. Um, what do you think of the things that we that we as individuals, whether they are businesses or or uh, policymakers, what could we do to improve how we do things? Yeah, there's a, probably a number of things in that space, but. Uh, one thing when we talk to our public health colleagues at the state and at the county level and ask them what, what do they need in order to, to take advantage of information technology and the digital solutions that are out there, it's people. They need trained people. And so we need to make sure that uh, while we, we focus on the technology, we want to apply that technology, we've got to have people that are in public health that have the training in data science that understand what it means to be an epidemiologist 2.0, uh, that they can actually do this next gen kind of work because we have to have those people to, in order for us to adopt those new technologies and implement them. Uh, we have been also working with the, like the same uh, contact tracing approach that, that Dr. Kang just mentioned uh, with Google and Apple, that, that, ad, that adoption is, is increasing, uh, but I think there is, there's some skepticism that we have to come over with a lot of folks. And so I think people understanding that we're all in this together, the use of technology can actually really help if you're participating in it, providing information, crowdsourcing and things like that. I think people embracing that and moving forward with it is going to be the best thing for us. I, I want, I'm re reading the chat box and George Chang is being very active with some very interesting questions, uh, which we won't have time to get to all of them and I apologize, but his question that really is more of a comment is how does digital technology might be employed in a democratic way for common for the commonwealth uh for the, for the common good not for surveillance capitalism or governance that that strikes the very core of what, what our issue is that 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 um minister tang i i'm, I'm mm -hmm. a bit uh, envious of, of the fact that you're i won't say it's easy 
because what you've done is obviously quite complicated. But to to be able to start the um, the dialogue with this certain level of trust between what the government's doing uh, and the citizens being willing to to give up or not surrender their privacy, but trust that the government's acting in their best interest is a very unique construct that we haven't quite gotten to here. But David, I, I think I think people in America don't trust the government and they will not give the information to the government, but they'll give their information just totally freely to Facebook and to many other places. So the, my point is, I think the private sector has a major role to play in creating this access to information. They already have the information. And I think we need to make the connection between the private sector and agencies like CDC to get used to this data in a very effective way. Mr. Chang, do you agree with that? Yeah, so um, um, full disclosure, before joining the cabinet as digital minister in 2016, I worked uh, with the Apple's Siri team um, for, uh, well, many years, six years, actually longer than the time I've been serving as digital minister for five years. Um, and, and so what we've learned working with the Siri team um, as a, uh, I, I work as a, um, what we call a liaison with the open source community, meaning that we want to share the language technology we develop at Apple without compromising privacy or cybersecurity, of course. But we also want the open source people to hold us to, uh, to account. Uh, meaning that uh, what we're saying is that this is a people-public-private partnership, meaning that the norm has to emerge from the social sector, meaning that if, uh, for example, uh, what we just talked about, handing the data of contact tracing and checking in, we prototype our systems with just pen and paper, even in the nightlife district, they can't just fill in a pseudonym or not a name at all, and just a contact number, which may be a prepaid SIM card. Uh, and then that venue keeps it for uh, 28 days. And if the contact tracer comes, of course, they have to hand it over. But if they don't, they just shred the ones four weeks before. And so this creates what we call a participatory self-surveillance, where it is decentralized and stored within the social sector, within the civil society, handing neither to Facebook nor the state. And then it creates a norm that people should not put real name in when you leave the, your check-in. And then our SMS-based check-in, as you just saw, uh, you don't have to type anything because that emerged from the social norm of not having to input your real name. And that, of course, may reduce the compliance risk. And, and this is the reason why we're having this call. The, the, the type, the, the, way, the way you're thinking, the way your country is thinking about that and how we in the United States can apply these concepts within our, within our social norms uh, is so valuable. Um, Dr. Monroe, I'd like to bring you in here for some, we're, we're about running up against the time, but I just think it's fascinating for us to be able to have these types of dialogues between the United States and Taiwan about how we can learn from each other on, on a topic of, 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 such, of such severity uh, is, is, is critical towards getting where we need to get to. Yes, uh, no doubt about it. Did you have a question for me, or do you want me to? No, I just want you. To, I'm this. I'm this. Not not a direct question, but is there any? If you had one takeaway that you'd want to offer to everyone who's on on the call, that they could do towards helping advance us in the right direction in the United States, what what would it be uh, around around this concept of of the digital technology space? Well, I mean, you know, I I do think. Fundamentally, trust has to be. Uh, if we don't have trust, we've we've lost the ball game, as far as I'm concerned. So, um, in the United States, uh, we we do do need to do much more to have the trust. Um, I think we've heard the private sector has solutions uh, that we can apply quite quite effectively. Um, and I will say, I mean, uh, throughout COVID, I mean, there are a number of examples actually here in the United States where there have been successful models of using technology. Um, the difficulty in the United States is taking it to full scale because of because we are not a national system. It's a state by state. So you'll end up with 23 states, 24 states, half a state. Um, and that's that's a real barrier to us being able to, to have the impact that, that we could have through digital technology. So much to learn from Taiwan. Minister Tang, I'd like to give you the last word before we break. But uh, I want to thank the panel for, for your participation. This has been a really fascinating conversation. Anything, any last words? 
Yeah, uh, I wish you all live long and prosper. <laughs> well, uh, again, I, I want to thank um, uh, the Elliot Wang and the folks of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office for their cooperation in bringing this program together. Um, I, I hope you found it fruitful in learning more about what's going on in Taiwan and and what we the challenges we face in the U.S. Uh, I found it fascinating, and uh, I want to I want to thank. Dr. Carlos Del Rio, Dr. Daniel Jernigan, Dr. Judy Monroe for a fascinating dialogue. And Minister Tang, good luck with uh, in Taiwan. I hope COVID-19 passes quickly and we get back to um, zero cases really soon. And uh, let's hope the same thing continues in the United States too, so we don't have this thing come back again. Thank you. All Live right. long and prosper. Bye. Live long and prosper. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Elliot, thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.